The noblest art is that of making others happy. And today on Western Trading Post TV, we are so very happy, happy, happy. We are going to be learning about vintage Navajo textiles, Mediterranean coral, visiting with inductees into the Arizona Farm and Ranch Hall of Fame, and learning about agriculture. So hold on to your hats and enjoy the ride. <laughs> What the heck? Grounds is normally here by now. Alarm's still set. What is that noise? Lived in a shack in the backwoods. <laughs> Hunted by the light of the moon. Scuffed up Tony Lama snake boots. Oh, Grounds is rocking the Christian rock again. Mrs. Olson. Oh my gosh, my Chloe Bill. Mm, how is my girl doing? Good, how are you? I am doing great. What do you have going on today? So I came in wondering if you'd be willing to give a, the Casa Grand FFA chapter a donation. A donation for? Throughout the year, we have a lot of traveling competitions, and in May, we have the end of the year banquet, which we give out awards for, so anything helps. Oh, well, and what do you do in your FFA chapter? Um, in our ag class, we learn a lot about animal sciences, the career options, we learn about soils, and we compete during competitions. And are you an officer? Yes, I'm the chapter secretary. Oh, which opens many doors, which one of the doors that I saw on social media the other day was you are now an ambassador for the Farm Bureau, is that correct? Yes. Oh, congratulations. Thank what all you. duties do you have with that? So me and three other high school girls, we get to represent the Farm Bureau and we get to go to their events and we get to meet new people and learn a lot more about the industry and hopefully pursue a career. Well, and I know you have been very involved in 4-H when you were younger and now FFA and now part of the Farm Bureau. Um, what kind of doors does this open for individuals that want to get involved in either 4-H or FFA? It's really good for scholarships. Um, there's a lot of ag opening jobs in the you know, future coming up and I think the more we get into it, the more kids we can get involved. Well, you know, I am such a huge fan of 4-H FFA and I am so super duper proud of you. Why don't we go talk to Grammy and see what kind of good donation we can put together. <laughs> Hey Rob. Hey Pops, what do we got Look here? Look what I just picked up. What in the world is this? This is an original Ted DeGrazia oil painting painted in 1954. <laughs> that was a little while ago. And this is a great oil painting. Actually, it's quite valuable. I'm, I'm stoked about it. What makes it so valuable? Well, Ted DeGrazia was a really well-known artist. He, he has millions and millions of prints and stuff like that out there because in the uh, 1960s, uh, one of his images, Los Niños, got picked up by one of the greeting card companies and you know he went worldwide then. He had, there was greeting cards, prints and everything like that. Worldwide he became a very very well known artist and uh, but there's not a lot of his originals out there. Don't we sell them like every month at the auction? Prints and, and uh, copies and stuff like that but originals no. So why aren't there that many originals? Well this this is a great story. So after he became famous as an artist, you know, he did lots of prints and whatnot, and not a lot of originals anymore. But then in 1976, he found out that the IRS valued his estate into the millions of dollars because he had all these uh, valuable original paintings around. Well, that made him mad. He's thinking, I'm not a millionaire. I've just got a lot of paintings sitting around. And uh, so in defiance of the IRS's rules, 
he took a whole bunch of his original oil paintings. They said over a hundred of them. He went out in the mountains, he put a camera up, and he filmed himself burning them in a big bonfire. <laughs> he said, the IRS isn't going to consider me a millionaire anymore just because of my paintings. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, there's not a lot of originals out there anymore. Um, and when they come up for sale, you know, one like this, um, if it's down there in the, the gallery in Tucson, uh, paintings of this size, you know, they normally have them priced at ten grand and up. Fantastic. So I think I'm going to put this one in an upcoming auction and just see how we do with it. Hmm. I'm looking forward to that then. <laughs> All right, cool. You're watching Western Trading Post TV on the Cowboy Channel. Today we're going to talk a little bit about Navajo rugs or Navajo textiles. Where do Navajo rugs come from, you might ask? Well, they come from the reservation, obviously. Or maybe they come from wherever the weaver happens to be living. But if you've been around Navajo textiles or Navajo rugs very much, you've probably heard terms like, oh, well, that's a Two Gray Hills or, or that's a Ganado. This rug on, on the front of the counter here is actually a Two Gray Hills. Well, how do we know that? In the early days of Navajo weaving, whenever the weavers started weaving for the tourist consumption, the only place that they had to sell their rugs was at the local trading post. So the traders from a certain area, the, the trader maybe at, at Ganado, for example, Lorenzo Hubble, famous trader in Ganado, he is marketing these rugs that are brought into his trading post. And he gets this bright idea, you know what, if my weavers would weave a certain way and use a lot of reds in, in the color pattern, I could market these rugs better. So he encouraged the weavers around Ganado to weave a certain style of red. Over at uh, Two Gray Hills, over there they got known for using their natural, all natural wool, natural colors. So you see a lot of blacks and uh, browns and grays and natural colors in the, the uh, weavings over there. Maybe over at Crystal, where J.B. Moore had his trading post, he, um, he encouraged weavers over there to weave certain patterns that today we still call a crystal pattern. So anybody who is knowledgeable in Navajo rugs can look at one and say, well, that came from this region or that region. And that kind of faded out around World War II. Well, why did the, the regional style start fading out, you might ask? As progress came to the reservation and uh, the weavers were able to travel further distances, they, they might go to their local trading post and, and they have this rug, and if they didn't get the deal they wanted there, they'd go on and try the next one and, and on down the road. And uh, eventually they got exposed to other styles and the styles started blending. And, you know, today, the weavers from the far west reservation where storm patterns used to be known might weave something that looks more like a, um, a two gray hills or a ganado because there's no set boundaries anymore and the weavers can sell their rugs anywhere. But anyways, on older Navajo textiles, early 1900s through about mid-century, you'll definitely see the regional styles in the rugs. And that has been today's helpful hint from Western Trading Post. Oh my stars, Jim, what are you up to? Look what I picked up, Grams. <gasps> Good heavens. Let's uh, fold this thing out, see what we got here. There you go. This is a big, nice, it's about seven by nine. It's a two gray hills pattern, probably circa 1930s or 40s. It's a all natural wool. It's a really tight weave and just in excellent condition for its age. It is beautiful. What do you think of it? It's impeccable shape. Yeah, oh. for its age especially. Exactly, where, where are we sitting on it? Well, we're into it about three grand, somewhere in that neighborhood, and I think it's at least a $5,000 rug. What do you think? Oh, it's an easy five. So maybe we put $49.95 on it so it goes quick? There you go, we got it. All right, well, let's, let's do that. Let's put $49.95 on it and we'll get it hung out in the gallery. Got it. So 
this cowpoke rode into town, right? And within the first hour, he shot the only artist in the town. Now the sheriff wanders up to him and says, hey, what's up with that? And the cowpoke says, well, I thought he said he was going to draw. Hello, my beautiful hey, friend. Hey, how, how are you? What are you doing, Miss Gorgeousness? Oh, it's always so good to see you. <laughs> what's going on? Well, you know, I'm... You know how I love to wear my turquoise oh, jewelry. Yes, yes. Well, I want to add to my jewelry collection and get some more color, more mm. pop in there. So I was wondering what your thoughts on coral are. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I absolutely love coral. Okay. And I think coral is such a fabulous investment okay. because it is now illegal to harvest coral here in the United States and because of pollution, because of other things, the coral is not as rich and red as it used to be. Okay, because um, when I think of coral, I just think of red. So I was wondering if it comes in other colors. Oh, it does actually. Coral, natural coral comes in red, orange, purple, pink, white, black, even. Oh. Yes. Um, you know, I have some white coral here that is just natural mm -hmm. white coral. Okay. But yes, yeah, so it comes in a lot That's of so different sweet. colors. And I truly think the older pieces are such a fabulous investment. And now you just have to decide, you know, what do you want? And um, is anything ca catch your eye? You know, this obviously pops oh, right out at me with the turquoise. Isn't the he gorgeous. Is gorgeous? This is a Victor Moses Begay. It's okay. probably early 80s, I'm, I'm guessing. And it does. It has the, the turquoise, the coral. So it great. is, um, it's $12.95. Okay. So okay. I, I really think that's a good, good deal on it but of course i own the shop but of but course. it really is you know we don't jack our prices up or anything like that yeah. so that that's a great piece and then you can still add your tur turquoise pieces with mm -hmm. it so that's so and easy beautiful. to add different bracelets yeah you know i would have to have bracelets <laughs> to go with it definitely okay well that helps me so much i knew you would have the information that i wanted and you would help me uh, get my little fashion statement going for vegas well so. and oh yes vegas is coming up yes, well I'm do excited. think about coral because it truly is a fabulous investment okay and if you ever needed to resell it you would do very well okay it. so it holds its value very it well. does okay great Thank well, you it's so good much. seeing you, my it's lovely. So good just to call see me you. and let me know what you I think. will, definitely. I'm going to think about this piece and I'll probably stop back in tomorrow. Okay. Have Bye. a good one. Bye. Bye. Every month, we have some of the most amazing pieces go through the auction. People can either bring them in or they can mail them in. This beautiful bear claw necklace and bracelet set came in from a lady from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And we're going to follow it through the auction and see how it does. All right, here we go. Lot 99. Lot 99. This is a large vintage bear claw statement piece right here. These next two items are going to be featured on a future episode of Western Trading Post TV. Yay! Here we go. You would have the distinct honor of saying, I own a TV piece. All right, here we go. Lot 99. I got a bid of 500 to give me a roll and 550 I got 950 on the floor, got a thousand, got a thousand, got a thousand, 950, got a thousand, got a thousand, got a thousand, 950, got a thousand, 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 got a thous
lot matches it. Here it is. <laughs> lot 100, lot 100. This is a vintage bear claw, and this is a statement piece right here. I had a similar necklace to this last year at the Las Vegas Cowboy Christmas Show that I sold for $2,500, and they didn't bat an eye. So, you guys ready? I got 850, bid 9850, got a bid 950, 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 got a bid Let me twelve, let me twelve, gotta be twelve, gotta be twelve, gotta be twelve. Let me twelve, let me twelve, gotta be twelve, gotta be twelve, don't let it slip. Gotta be twelve, gotta be thrill, gotta be twelve, hundred, twelve, hundred, twelve, hundred, gotta be twelve. I got let me twelve, let me twelve. Anyone else wanna play? Let me twelve, let me twelve, let me twelve. Let me twelve, they're having a conference. Let me twelve, let me gotta be twelve, gotta be twelve, gotta be twelve hundred, twelve hundred, twelve hundred, twelve hundred, twelve hundred going once. Twelve hundred going twice. Sold eleven hundred dollars to I. Six oh six, six oh six for eleven hundred dollars. There we go. Log one oh one. This is a pair two mid century Navajo textiles. Two Navajo textiles. One money. We are here in the Western Heritage Room with the Button family. The Buttons are some of the largest farmers on the Gila Indian Reservation, and they have also been inducted into the Arizona Farm and Ranch Hall of Fame. Guys, congratulations on your induction into the Arizona Farm and Ranch Hall of Fame. What does that mean to you? Well, it was a special honor that came to us uh, actually by surprise, and uh, we were proud to have been recognized for some of the things that we've done, which we didn't think were very great contributions, but we're also very proud to be associated with others who are listed in that Farm and Ranch Hall of Fame. Well, it was not a surprise to any of us. And just congratulations again, because I know that is such a huge honor for farmers. Uh, I know that you were instrumental in getting irrigation back on the reservation. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Well, the Pimas have been irrigating from time immemorial, so that would take a long discussion to really bring you up to speed on what's been going on there. But in the early 1900s, they lost their water to uh, diversions upstream. They've fought a long, hard battle to reestablish those water rights and are currently now, after having won their recent water settlement, a negotiated settlement that recognized all the water users in the state, one of the largest irrigation systems in the country, in the world actually, it's currently being built called the Pima Maricopa Irrigation Project. That'll be line ditches to help conserve water. All of that is a culmination of the work of many, many generations of hardworking Pima statesmen and farmers from our early councilmen and governors to our current administration today. They are the ones that really did all this work. We're proud to have been associated with them and helped them where they needed it in committees. Now it's incumbent upon us to utilize those water resources to bring the agricultural land on the reservation into production, provide employment for the people there, and also reestablish the, the use and consumption of the native Pima crops. And that's where Ramona's specialty is. I was gonna say, Ramona of Ramona Farms, you have been instrumental as well in educating um, others about the farming in your area. What have you done to do that? Well, um, it began when I was a very young kid. And uh, the, uh, my dad was the inspirational person in my family to me because he showed me how to plant in different soils. He also uh, had a vision. When we, he, we first began, we'd climb the Sacton Mountain, my father and I, and he'd ask me, what do you see out there in the valley? And I said, rocks, sticks, and dirt, more dirt and trees. And he said, I see something different. I see greenery, plants. And I said, well, I don't know who's going to do it. <laughs> and he said, you are. And so that's my story of and beginning you that. did it. And Velvet, what do you guys farm now? 
Um, we, uh, for our traditional crops, we grow the tepary bean. We grow three different colors of the tepary beans native to the Sonoran Desert. It was a wild bean and cultivated here by our people for several centuries. Um, we have a black tepary bean, which is chocolatey and rich and delicious in flavor. Um, a brown tepary bean, which I know is your favorite. That is my favorite, and yes. And they are <laughs> a nutty and earthy and just delicious in every application. Um, and then the white tepary bean is kind of buttery and sweet. It has very soft, smooth texture, so great for salad dressings or sandwich spreads, or just good just smashing them up and eating them. And you do a cooking show and educate others about how to utilize the beans and the corns and all of that, don't you? I do, and um, it's been very important to re reteach um, how to use these foods in our kitchens today and introducing them, reintroducing them to our everyday table as opposed to just saving them for a traditional meal or grandma's uh, traditional soups on special occasions for ceremony and whatnot. It is an, a delicacy, delicacy to be shared every day, um, especially with their abundant nutrients inside each and every small portion. It is definitely needs to be on every table. They are fabulous. And I just have to congratulate the Buttons again. It is an absolute honor to have them in our community and to have them keep the rich Native American history alive. Congratulations, guys, and thanks for being here today. Thank you. Well, thank you. We were sitting on the third base side back in 1985. Game seven was on the line. Bottom of the ninth, bases loaded.